Welcome to Worlds Collide, a wrestling card podcast for wrestling fans by wrestling fans. Featuring Tony Bella from WrestlingTradingCards.com. This is like a, a stock market. Like- and Zan Morning from Wrestling With Cards on YouTube. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer, I'm just posing the question. Join them as they navigate the world of wrestling cards, helping you build a bigger and better collection and making some money along the way. What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to Worlds Collide. Two, or in this case, four personalities loving wrestling cards getting together. It's another round table. We started doing these. We've only done one so far, but I think it's really an awesome way to just kind of get some banter going back and forth about wrestling cards. And we've got two guests that have not been on yet this podcast. David Peck, Yam Wax, welcome. Thanks, Sam. Going on, guys. We've got uh, two legends in two separate fields, kind of. <laughs> I'm going to call Yamwax the pop culture legend. I don't care what he says. I don't care what you guys say. He is. And then we've got David. I don't even need to give you an introduction. <laughs> Tony, you got anything? No, man. I'm just uh, sitting there enjoying your uh, your banter already. <laughs> ah, I love it. I was uh, telling guess- you guys you guys earlier that I kind of feel like the Dennis Miller on Monday night, you know, Monday night football situation. Like, why is this guy here? But um, I'll do my best to maybe add a little something here and there, but you know, no, go no, through you're an me. important piece, man. We got to have hey. you on. I agree. Based on the topics we have selected today too, I think okay. you are the one of the perfect guests because some of this, like it's kind of a, a lot of this stuff can be generalized for any type of cards. I mean, obviously mo- the three of us are primarily wrestling card collectors, but I think a lot of this information could like there's information out there that wrestling fans are not looking at in the hobby that could actually help them if they would think outside the box. But uh, let's just jump into that. Uh, David, we're going to let you start things off. Well, um, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So you, um, you know, we all are going to sort of pick topics and, uh, my, my topic for the night is talking about grading and, and PSA. And I tell you, we're at a really strange juncture in the card hobby because, um, you know, it's interesting when Tony and I did a show, um, you know, in the last year, you know, we were kind of warming him up to grading and stuff. And uh, it was right before uh, the markets really started taking off and, and not specifically wrestling, but just cards in general. And what we, you know, saw was that the number of submissions to all the grading companies uh, really skyrocketed. And so with that has come price increases. And and then it obviously escalated to a point where uh, some of the companies just stopped receiving submissions altogether. So I think it's a really um, hard thing to predict because, you know, when, when I first started submitting cards to PSA in April of 2010, they would run specials as low as $4.75 a car. Um, (laughs) And, you know, and, and, you know, and and bear in mind, values were obviously lower back then. So exceeding the hundred dollar threshold of declared value was sort of challenging. Well, now, you know, you fast forward and, you know, grading costs, like I've got an order at PSA right now that I got in, you know, sort of a little before uh, the, the sort of explosion um, and, you know, so, but it's been sitting there for, you know, six months and that was at the $12 per card level. Well, one of the things that happened to me on my last few submissions is they now are starting to hit you with upcharges on cards that uh, that they deem that are you know a higher value, and so for example, I had submitted some Hulk Hogan uh, eighty two All Stars and uh, a Ric Flair and, and some Andres, and you know I'd submitted some of those at higher service levels because I thought they were in better condition. But um, you know if you look at for example, like take the Hulk Hogan, uh, their SMR has the PSA eight at five hundred dollars. Well you know, we realize that's not an accurate, you know, viewpoint or or price point. They don't update it all the time. Um, But on my last submission, uh, they, you know, even on a six, they hit you for um, 
somewhere around, I think it was $75 or $100 upcharge, right? Mm. And so I think one of the things that's going to make card grading complicated going forward is we don't know what the prices are going to be. Uh, we don't know what the turnaround times are going to be. And, you know, PSA, they want a, a piece of the action. And so, um, and I understand that because, you know, one of the reasons that I was so turned on by cards early on was I felt like, wow, this is uh, the first thing in my life where, you know, I can buy something, invest a few more dollars. And I literally have, at least up to this point, 100% win ratio on my submissions. That's not to say each card turns out how I want it, but, you know, if I invest 500 or $1,000, I'm easily going to make that back. Well, coming in a few days, they're going to outline, you know, sort of what the future looks like. And I don't know what the uh, minimum price point is going to be. I mean, is it going to be $20? Is it going to be $30? Is it going to be $50? And so I think that's a real uh, unknown. And it's something that impacts the wrestling card market a lot more than perhaps others. Because, you know, if you look at the, um, the average retail price of a wrestling card versus, say, you know, a baseball card, it's lower. Uh, now, there's less wrestling cards graded. And so some of those are selling for more than, say, common baseball cards. But, you know, make no mistake about it. You do not see multi-million dollar cards in the wrestling card market, whereas, you know, in basketball and baseball and now hockey, you know, you've got cards that have exceeded a million dollars. I mean, that's just a completely different threshold. So what I think shame. we're in for a... Um, <laughs> what a shame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, One day, that? maybe we'll get there. <laughs> what a shame. Well, no million I, dollar I, wrestling cards. No, nah, I, you know, the, the, I think that it, as much as we'd like to perhaps see that happen, I, I, I don't think that the collector base is ever going to warrant that. But r regardless, it's not to say that they can't go up. It's just that, you know, if you take it like take Pokemon and Magic the Gathering just for argument's sake. Some very, very deep-pocketed people moved in uh, to that genre and got real serious. Um, you also have, you know, a lot of people in the technology sector. I mean, um, Steve Wozniak, for example, I remember seeing him post a PSA 10 uh, of the Black Lotus, and it was signed by the um, illustrator or the maker, and, you know, I mean, what's the difference between 250 and 750 for somebody that's, you know, worth hundreds of millions? Not much. And, you know, people have listened to me over the years. I actually believe they get, they'd rather almost pay 750. It makes them more excited. It's, it's it has more appeal. So, but that said, I think we're, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. And, you know, my, my second favorite grading company is SGC. I think they do a very good job. I think it's it's very good to see that they're um, turning cards around quickly, and you know it. Uh, I think they're they're a good option. And and then you know it's funny. Last night I posted on Twitter. I saw uh, a C CSG. I think is what it's called. And you know I just can't get into that company slabs. I get it. They have reputable um, reputation and comics and so on, but their slab is just not attractive. And so that's where I think SGC is in a prime spot because, you know, they're, the cards present very well in, in their holders. So we'll just see where it goes. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting about the price tier differential between wrestling and some of the other sports and how um, the issues with PSA and the cost to grade really could impact wrestling specifically. I found that really interesting. I've never thought about that, David. It's a good point. Um, and as you think about PSA coming back, there's a lot of rumors or speculation that we're not going to see all the tiers come back on July 1st. Um, they've they've pr almost promised that we're getting some tiers come July 1st. But my guess is I wouldn't be surprised if it's only that express tier that used to be 150. And what's it going to come back at? Is it 150 is still very expensive and it could be higher. We don't know because they've also talked about needing to make some tough decisions. How do they regulate the number of cards coming in so they don't get deluged again? So what does that look like? Is it a lottery? Is it a higher price point? Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how that happens. And I, I totally agree with you on SGC. Um, I've been super impressed. Now, I was kind of down on them last year because they had a lot of, it seemed like operational issues delivering on their promises. 
but this year it seems like they're knocking out of the park. I just did my first submission with SGC. Some of those uh, Elon Musk cards that I was submitting uh, came back and they turned these uh, from door to door, sending it out to back to me was within two weeks, had a couple of questions and different things. And they were like on the spot, you know, PSA, you're lucky to get a response within a couple of days, but these guys were back to me same day. And um, I, I like PSA a lot. I'm really optimistic about what Nat Turner is going to do in the long term, but he's got a massive ship to turn around right now. And um, it's going to take a while. So there is that opportunity for SGC and, and BGS is interesting where I think they have that amazing brand uh, in the hobby, you know, going back to the Beckett mags, but people don't, you know, forget that they were the third company into the game. It was PSA in 91, SGC in 98, and then BGS finally started grading in 99. Um, and they did, you know, no doubt they've been a top tier grader, but when they have been so silent and everybody's sort of wondering what's going on there, why is, you know, they're taking as long, if not longer than PSA on anything, but the express tiers and, just like what, what's been going on there. They don't, we don't seem to know. So I I'm optimistic for them, you know, or I, I'm hopeful for them, I should say, because it's such a great brand, but I agree. I, my favorite two right now as well, David, are PSA and, and SGC. Tony, go ahead. Uh, do you guys think that there's like um, any room in the market now for any other companies to come in and, and, and make some sort of a splash? You're kind of getting into my question for later. I love it. <laughs> do we want to save that one, Zan, or what do you think? Uh, yeah, you let's can. save it. Let's save it. All right. Tony, you well, got anything else, though? Uh, I don't have a lot, but I have another question to throw back at David. So if nah, you have anything go else. Go for it. David, I, can I add something on uh, the CSG? Yeah. I I really, I totally agree. I think one of our first encounters on Twitter between the two of us was a little actually adversarial because I was making a prediction that CSG could really make inroads. I like their pedigree as a company where they had all that history. And, um, and I liked hearing the things about them pulling graders away from BGS um, to lead their group. And it was like, all oh, that was so promising. But then they dropped that green header slab and the billboard. And I almost feel like they could have gone away with one or the other, but the combination is just unfortunate. And they've also had their uh, struggles, kind of like SGC did last year, turning things around by the sounds of it and gotten backed up. And so it was really just that triple whammy, I think, um, hindered them. I think they're a great brand. And I think they actually will be viable in Pokemon and Magic, where they do the blue slab and they're known as uh, CGC. Uh, they're pretty respected there uh, already. And so I think I think that might end up being kind of their lane is, is some of those like TCG games. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen over time, but I'm not quite so sure on them either. Well, the thing is, is that for a long period of time, many hobbyists thought the Beckett slab was the, the best slab, right? And I actually think personally, it's pretty clunky. And it's big. And so one of the things I like about the PSA lab is that you can shuffle them. Like, let's say you have a stack of 10 cards. You can kind of shuffle them in your hand. So, I mean, they're, it, it's obviously not like shuffling raw cards, but it's closer. Um, mm -hmm. They stack well. But I also think that the the holder, the, I've always liked the, the way the red looks. And I feel like it looks official. And I also feel like you kind of focus on the card. And the, the, ch the challenge with the, uh, the CSG slab is all you see is that big label. And it, they really, in, in my view, would have been better served to make it smaller. Um, the green, you know, it's debatable how, how you want to go with that. But um, there's no doubt. Like, I mean, I looked at that Ric Flair that was posted. It's an eight, you know. So I think that the good news, I think what you want to see from these newer companies is actually legitimate grading because the, the knock has always been on that. Oh, well, it's remember back in the day, pro grading and, you know, everything was trimmed or everything was a gym mint 10 and it's like 70, 30 centering and so on. So if, if you really want to make strides in the market, you've got to grade things accurately because that's the only way you're going to actually have realized values uh, look good. And I'm a hundred percent convinced that people go with where they, for the most part, think they get their best bang for their buck. So, you know, to me early on, I just thought PSA was going to be the leader. Uh, they were already the leader. I mean, they, and you know, a lot of people used to argue with me online when I would, you know, quote the statistics, I knew them from, you know, people at the company. I mean, there was a time that PSA legitimately had 89% market share. Um, you know, of all graded cards. 
I mean, SGC was around two or three percent. And so, you know, now the market for just total submissions has exploded. We're obviously PSA is hoping that other companies take some of their business. But I think when you mentioned Nat Turner, this is what's going to be really, really sort of the wild card going forward is PSA was never run by the smartest guys in the room. Uh, Nat Turner and Stephen Cohen and, and their team, I mean, these people, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I hate PSA and, oh, they're so slow and, you know, they shouldn't be going to the national with graders. I mean, anything you'll read online, it, there's always people have a comment. Well, these are businessmen. I mean, they legitimately understand business. It's not, you know, PSA was set up as, I, I don't want to say a mom and pop shop, but they were never run by Wall Street type people. And so what will be really interesting is, is that, you know, they used to get about 2.6 million cards a year. That exploded to north of 13 million. And I think it's even higher now. So they're going to have to figure out a pricing structure where they may want lower volumes at a higher average per card grading fee, right? So we don't know what that looks like. So I think that, you know, you, you read all the speculation online, but at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of unknowns and I think it's going to be an evolving process and it's going to take time. And, you know, people like us, they collect, you know, like I posted before we got on this, some, you know, like a Hercules Hernandez OPG card. It's a PSA eight, right? I did that for, because I just wanted to have every base card from the OPG series too. Well, I'm not sending that in at $25 or $50 or $100. You know, I sent that in at like $6. So it's it's going to impact uh, us. I mean, I have a whole stack of cards in my safe that I was about to send in, but I'm not grading a lot of these at $25, $50. You know, I'm in it to every card I send in, there's an attempt to make money, you know, not, not necessarily to sell, but I just want to feel like I, I, you know, earned a return. Right. right. Yeah. They, um, I know several interviews nat turner said that um the whole point of the registry was to grade complete sets so by saying that that means that they're probably going to bring back at least i think a tier low like a low level tier but for those base cards to complete sets but david like you said the question is you know is that tier that was twenty dollars in bulk now going to be 50 is it going to be a hundred and at that point, it just doesn't make it feasible. Um, the other question I want to throw back at you is, I think you out of the out of the four of us are the, maybe the only one who's got returns back because uh, Yamwax, I don't know if you've got any PSA returns out. Tony, I know you do. Um, I've got them out since last year. Still haven't gotten them back yet. You've got some recently back and the grades have been, seems like very harsh, not just with you, but with others. So just like to get your opinion on that. Well, um, I definitely think, in some ways, the grading standards have tightened. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious if some of it has to do with um, hiring a lot of new graders, right? And they're being cautious. Um, you know, about 18 months ago, there was a lot of talk um, online. I mean, there definitely was some... Uh, altered cards that made it into slabs. And so I think in some ways the grading companies are being extra cautious, um, you know, for, for that purpose. I read this, these comments about quote unquote pop control. Um, I don't really buy into that at all because uh, like, for example, somebody contacted me recently about some Randy Savage rookies. PSA does not care about that card. Uh, they're not going to just give you a seven <laughs> because, well, it's, you know, it, it, it's not even on their radar. Now, you want to top pop control, take the 79 uh, Wayne Gretzky. Um, that card, you know, you might be able to make the argument. 1980 tops, Ricky Henderson. There you might be able to make the argument. 1993 SP Derek Jeter might be able to make the argument. But, you know, when I send in a Harley race, or a Pedro Morales, uh, the grader's not thinking, man, we need to protect the house. Come on, so, man. Those are big names. <laughs> um, for, but for these I guys. do think, you know, at the, at the the thing also, though, is, like, funny because I, I was pretty upset when I – well, I shouldn't say pretty upset. I was sort of annoyed. Um, 
that I got a, a six on this Hogan recently that I thought was a seven. I have to admit, I think it's a six. I, you know, I, I, I saw it in my safe and I looked and all of a sudden I was like, ooh, this top right corner has got a little damage to it. Um, so I think some of it also is, is a lot of the people sending in cards are not experienced. Um, and so what they think is a seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, is, you know, they don't have a lot of experience at it. Now, I am seeing on the modern front, though, that a lot of these um, breakers and, and folks that submit large volume are getting nines where they, you know, generally got a lot of tens before. And I can't really speak to why that's happening. But I think that the part of this that's actually the, the, the toughest to deal with is PSA doesn't want you cracking and submitting cards now. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence uh, uh, and um, it, that I've read online of where they'll send the card back to somebody and not regrade it. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you always had in the past was if you didn't agree with the grade, you could always pop it out and send it back and, and take the risk and pay again and, you know, see if you get, you know, a better grade. And, you know, if you take that away, um, you know, now it's like, you know, you're, you're stuck with, you know, whatever that grade was. And, and I can tell you from personal experience that, that I have done that. I have cracked out cards before and, and received different grades, um, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, sometimes actually most of the time, the same grade. Um, but, but it happens. And so the, um, I think that PSA, I think their motivation is it doesn't, you know, make you look very good when the opinion changes, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a personal, uh, situation. So probably like in 2011, um, there was a, somebody on the message board had, had posted a, a, a PSA 10 that, that Probstein was running of a 1950s baseball card and a PSA 10. And it went for like 4,000 something dollars. Well, they traced it back to um, uh, uh, an eight that had gone for like 40 something dollars. And, you know, I'm not certain if it was altered, but whatever the case may be, it looked very similar. So I remember sending an email to Joe Orlando. I mean, I was outraged. Like, you know, I was brand new into card grading. I thought, well, wait a second, you know, PSA, if they tell you it's an eight, it's an eight, you know, if, 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 how does an eight go to a 10? And I thought he'd be, you know, sort of mortified and, you know, like, and, and he just sent me a kind of a rough email back and said, if you want to talk about it, you know, give me a call. And I said, yeah, I do. So you know, he kind of smart me up back then that, the reality of it is, is the graders are human. Um, they, uh, you know, sometimes they grade conservatively. Other graders look at, you know, and I, I think like if you talk to men, just for example, like some guys are, are boob guys, some guys are ass guys, some guys are face <laughs> guys. Well, it's the same with card grading. So some, some graders put more weight, let's say on corners. Other graders put more weight on, centering or the registration you know the, the way the card looks or focus you know others will see like a little print defect and say okay i can't give this a 10 where another grader might say you know it doesn't really interfere with the eye appeal so it's not a perfect sign and so i do think that you know they've also announced they're going to start bringing in some ai technology i watched a video earlier today and i think it's hga <laughs> yeah um, we're going to get into it, that later <laughs> okay I didn't think their setup looked very impressive. It looked like a boiler room, but um, but what I did think was cool though, and I will give them credit for this, is they were scanning in the card. You could see the guy um, zooming in, you know, looking for flaws and things like that. And so I think what's probably going to happen over time is um, some of the human element will be taken away from card grading, not completely, but some of it. And so. That, that's where I think PSA with Matt Turner being a technology expert, you know, he's, he's very aware of the shortcomings, I think. And, you know, so not being able to read great cards. I mean, how embarrassing is it when somebody on a message board sends in a card 10 different times for fun, just to see what the system does and gets like seven different grades like that, that doesn't actually speak well to card grading. I mean, the whole, basis of card grading is it's supposed to be a non-biased third party 
that's an expert. And if the opinion changes over and over and over again, you know, it's not really conducive to the trust of the brand. Mm -hmm. So if now you can limit that from happening, um, that's good for them. I mean, it's just, so we'll see. There's a, there's a, uh, I, I think we're in a, a period of time though, where a lot of these grades more has to do with uh, people just not really knowing what they're doing or, uh, you know, missing stuff. Cause I, I've been doing this, I've been sending cards in and, you know, heck Rob grades way more cards than I have, but you miss stuff all the time. I mean, I have an embarrassing one in my collection. It's a Andre the Giant. 87 Opeachy with a huge wax, like a gum stain on the front that, that, that I missed. So it happened. Rob, I think when we or I'm sorry, not Rob, David, when we think of these um, technology improvements, I mean, I think they're really essential adding, whether it's just the high res scanning, the centering tools, those things that they're going to add in and guys like Nat who are tech focused, that's going to happen. But it's not just about accuracy and that accuracy is huge. But when we look at this backlog and the deluge and how many cards they get. A big part of it is speed to help the graders get through backlogs quicker and to get cards graded faster over time. So I, I, I do think Nats probably has to see that as part of the solution as do the other companies. Um, but I, I, hearing a lot of what you're saying, I'm, here, I'm just thinking a lot about human incentive and um, environment. I mean, so these guys, it's to us, like these are our cards and they're really important, uh, of course. And, and we scrutinize them probably far more than, than even the graders do in terms of the grades that we get. I mean, they scrutinize it to very close detail, but you know, I, I think you're right with new graders on the line. Imagine you have a boss down the line, because if you're a new grader, you know, you're not on the Q, probably on the QA team. You're not the person that checks the card after it's been graded, which someone always does. I believe at PSA, um, you're the first person to look at it. And so you, you're nervous and you don't want to give a card a 10 that shouldn't be a 10 because you know your boss is going to be right there on you saying like, what? you missed this mark, you missed that. And so they're scrutinizing these things probably pretty heavily when they're new. Um, and and that, that's just my guess is the incentives of these new graders, they just don't want to get in trouble. And so they're being very, very harsh now. And I think over time, we'll just see that sort of ease in, loosen up. And Nat's talked about how some of these newer sets as well don't have quite the quality control. And I, I do hear a lot of that. I, that can't be the whole story. But um, so I think there's a couple of things. And then the last thing is like just on those big, big cards, I, I don't know if it's pop control exactly. But also like imagine someone hands you a, a T206 card just to hold as a person, like someone hands that you, you get to hold a Honus Wagner T206. I mean, your hands are going to be shaking. You're going to be holding that thing like as carefully as possible because it's a invaluable piece of hobby history and a, a treasure. Um, and the same thing, like with a grader, they're going to give any premium card so much scrutiny because of what it is. It just, it's just natural. And so I think those get closer eyes and they probably even have more than, you know, the normal people look at it, maybe two to three times as many people look at it. And that makes it tough to get a 10 just in general. So there's a lot of factors, pop control. I mean, is there a, is there are a few rogue people like worried about that? Who knows? They're all humans, but um, I think just a lot has to do with the process. Well, the thing about the, those big cards though, that people have to understand is PSA knows that they're handing you a lot of money. Okay, mm -hmm. so they, they are getting, you know, more grading fees, right? And that's where I get a little upset with a lot of the trolls online, just the ph philosophical. It's in theory, if let's just take a Ricky Henderson 1980 tops um, and it grades a 10, well, PSA can charge you like $1,000, right? Well, wouldn't it be in their best interest actually to grade more 10s and get that $1,000? No, believe it or not, they send a lot of those cards back minimum size requirement where they don't even get paid. And so, you know, I think a lot of folks just don't have business acumen and they don't understand that. And so, you know, the other huge issue is, is that, you know, I think that, you know, people forget PSA honors their grade. So, you know, like in the, there, in some of those cases where there were trimmed cards, And so I think that's the, the another big issue is like, do I really want to like grade this Ricky Henderson a 10? Now it's a hundred twenty five thousand dollar card. Um, you know, there there's risk to us. And so it better well be a 10, you know. And so I, 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 I don't know. I just think that, that a lot of people 
um, say stuff online and don't really think about the big picture and say, you know, wow, wait a minute, this is a for-profit business. If they were as greedy as I think they are, then they'd be given high grades, not low grades, get higher grading mm -hmm. fees. Tony, got anything? No, this is a lot. very educational for me as someone who's new to the grading uh, in the past year. And I, I reached out to David very early on when I started wanting to get into grading. Um, yeah, this is all new eye opening things for me. And there are a lot of great perspectives here to look at. And um, I'm learning every, every day about this stuff. I'm relatively yep. new to grading myself. I've had kind of an interesting ride of waiting for cards and I haven't gotten a sub yet, um, but I expressed a few of those 97 Panini rocks um, at the end of February. I'm still waiting. Uh, express service used to be a five day service. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the roller coaster ride of like my LCS was kind of clueless about the process and I submitted through them and they really thought I was going to get them back in like three weeks on a express service. And so I was all jonesed up. I'd heard other things, but I'm like, Oh, maybe my LCS has like a connection or something. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to get it before Rob's auction closed. And then it closes so high. Uh, if I had any chance of a 10, which I probably don't, you know, I'm probably going to hit eights and at probably eights, you know, maybe nine, we'll see. Um, but then I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get huge upcharges. Now it's come down a little bit where I'm actually uh, kind of comfortable with that. But um, I've been waiting forever, just like watching the card move through the market. I did do I'm... an HGA service. My first uh, grading came back. I, I got my HGA service. I did modern. That's what I did. I just did mod, just to test them out. Definitely them. saving that discussion for my topic. Yes. <laughs> since Tony has experience with HGA, we're gonna rely on him for that. Uh, the only thing I've got to say about the lower grades. I've never been somebody that has to have the PSA 10 or a nine. You know, I just bought recently an 18, I think it was 1887. It's yep. like one of the first wrestling cards that ever existed. And it's like a SGC three. I'm like, cool. Like it, authentic <laughs> it authenticates it. It's got a cool slab. Like I'm good with that. So like I've got, uh, I think my, one of my all-star Hogan's is like a SGC four. I'm like, cool. I'm okay with that. <laughs> it's, and it's a lot more affordable to get into the lower grades. So a lot of the stuff I'm buying raw, I'm getting it at such a discount anyway, that if I'm getting, if I end up with eights, like, I'm like, that's, that's a huge win. But me and David have actually talked about this before. And I think both of us get a lot of flack online for it. Having it in a PSA slab alone, the Cadillac of grading is just going to, you know, throw the value through the roof, really, no matter what the grade is. Zan, um, well, to the folks out there, make sure to go to Zan, Zan Morning's Instagram page. It's at Zan Morning, correct? And yes, look at is. this. Thank you. Look at this card from 1887. It's it's so cool. It's an Allen and Ginter uh, wrestler card. And we're talking 130-ish years old there. It's just amazing. So cool, dude. I think any card from that vintage is just neat to have. And I love the name of the wrestler, Young Bibby. Young Bibby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, I've got more to talk about that I can mention on this PSA thing, but I'm going to save it for my topic. So Yay Mike, you're up next with your topic. Oh, okay. Right on. Well, <laughs> I, I threw out a topic there. Um, I guess it's a topic for everybody. I, I, did, I didn't necessarily come up here with a uh, monologue to say, but I can certainly <laughs> jump into that a little bit. Um, and that's on just uh, something I've been thinking about a little bit lately is the role, and, and especially as I dabble in wrestling, is the role of memes as they enter into card collecting. Um, the, now, now memes can mean uh, specifically like the memes that we encounter on the internet, the doge dog going to the moon and, and all the other things like that, right? Um, which are incredibly more and more important in, in our society. But it can also just mean like going back before the internet um, when things would go kind of viral in the more um, you know analog way and just something as simple as like, um, you know, the eat your vitamin, you know, eat your vitamins, say your prayers and that kind of stuff, like things right. that we would repeat in culture is really what, when something's mimetic. Right. So, you know, things like that, um, how they affect card collecting and how they make those individuals sticky in culture. And I think get more people just enthused about potentially like, Oh, I love that. The classic example to me, uh, in wrestling is, uh, Macho Man and his commercials with Slim Jim, you know, the 
<laughs> when you when I, I've talked to people who are like, oh yeah, I know Macho Man, the Slim Jim guy, slam into a Slim Jim, like every everybody knows that. Um, so I, I feel like that adds to their whole patois, to their um, you know who they are, and makes people like love that character. Sometimes just because they were in a, a series of commercials, and then that draws them into learning more of the persona. Um, but just the the joy of the um, you know of of that meme uh, being sticky in culture. Uh, makes them more interesting as a collectible. And let, let me see if I can uh, get this. Can that also yeah. apply to like people starring in TV shows and movies? Yes, that that's are, that actually are, that are that are outside their normal re- world. So we have a lot of pro wrestlers now, like The Rock, and we have John Cena now jumping into you know mainstream as far as movies go and stuff like that. Is it the same yeah. thing. That that can be the same thing. I mean, I, it's, it's I think it's not the same, but it's related. Um, in that it's that it's that influence, you know, or or just uh, omnipresence. Like you see them in culture more, so then it causes people to dig into the characters, or when they get the card to think, oh, I love that guy. Like I love I love the whether it's um, the, just the slogans, or I think, but I'm I'm I am actually specifically talking about like memes that people use to share. So the fact that The Rock has like a ton of memeable. Uh, yeah. GIFs from Jiffy that you can add to say Instagram stories or Snapchats and stuff like makes those people just like really sticky and beloved by uh, particularly the younger culture. You see it more and more. And so like, because they've seen like, you know, the rock flexing or, or different things and raising his one eyebrow. I mean, that was mimetic already because people would imitate that. Yeah. Um, but now that it's, sh- it's shared so frequently and people are like just responding rather than adding any text in the response to a tweet, someone just sends a GIF an animated GIF with like the rock, you know, raising an eyebrow or flexing or whatever uh, to that has nothing to do with wrestling. They're just responding in, in conversation. And I, I, um, I so badly want to find me a card now, like where's the beef lady or something like that. Or yeah, or... exactly. <laughs> like the, the memes themselves become yeah. the pop culture. I want to find yeah. spot the dog from target and just, uh, <laughs> totally. so I picked up this one. Uh, this is showing just quick clip of Pete Weber the bowler. I never thought that I'd own a bowling card, but Pete Weber has this great moment where he just gets so hyped and he's so excited and he's telling the crowd like, you know, who do you think you are? I am. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing. That's, that's right? total like, pro wrestling right there. It, it, I yeah. love that though. It's, that's great. I it's like it. pro wrestling. So then I, I couldn't, when I saw this card, there's, you know, Pete Weber and they're incredibly inexpensive. That's amazing. I'm like, I, and he just, he looks amazing in this picture too. So it's a Pete Weber rookie with the auto on it. Like it's so fun. And so that was just a case of like a, a meme inspiring me to want to pick up a card. And, and you know what, I, um, you know, I don't, I didn't necessarily follow the macho man, um, that, that much. I know him more from his commercials, to be honest, you know, it was sort of in that window where I was, uh, out of the eighties wrestling. And before I started to kind of watch the attitude era a little bit. So, um, yeah, I, I just resonate, I think sometimes with people based on these memes and, and we see that with pop culture cards and stuff quite a bit that, you know, just their resonance and culture and more and more, we're going to see that because they happen to be in a lot of GIFs. That's true. So we got to find some cards eventually with that lady and the cat. Are they going to find that now too, or what? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Like uh, the kid, was it Tommy bit my finger and <laughs> some of yeah, those things. I yeah. don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I can I say see. that I've, I've done that for sure. Like um, things that are outside of wrestling something will i see i'll see something that's being used all the time and uh i'm a huge I'm, like christmas is my favorite holiday so i would constantly see christmas vacation memes and then it kind of got me i don't have any yet but it kind of got me leading down like okay are there any christmas vacation cards no, if there's not okay i need to look for the celebrity cards and try to get the <laughs> autos or parallels whatever so it does work and then in wrestling uh two specific examples come to mind macho man I like his, he's got a few different cards in the 1995 main event set and his gear, it just screams Slim Jim. <laughs> and they're, they're awesome cards for the fact that at that time period, it represents those commercials. And I, I bought several sets of those, mainly for the Steve Austin card. But as I was going through those, I see these Macho Man cards and I was saving all of them because they were just such an iconic image of an iconic time. It's a little time capsule. And then the same thing I can say, yep, that's it. That's one of them right there. <laughs> look at the back. Yeah, how can you not uh, look yes. at that and just think <laughs> of Slim Jim? It's perfect. And then, uh, like, I keep thinking of, like, people that I see that this is maybe going a little bit outside of the memes, but there are memes of them. 
Um, first thing that comes to mind is Eric Bischoff. And then I relate that back to the 83 Weeks podcast that I listen to all the time, which then makes me go back and be like, I need Eric Bischoff cards. Not because like I'm just a fan, but like he truly did something in professional wrestling history that no, that completely changed wrestling with the Monday Night War. So, you know, that's just something that I think could prop up value and popularity of somebody like that, that just on the surface, most people are not thinking about. Totally. Absolutely. What do you think, David? Yeah, I think it's a, a tremendous point. Um, you know, early on, when I got uh, into wrestling cards, I, um, you know, would post on the PSA message board and, you know, everybody made fun of them and so on. And one of the things I said was, listen, you know, Mike Schmidt can walk in the Orlando airport and maybe a couple people know who that is, right? Hulk Hogan walks in the airport. Everyone knows who it is. And yep. so I think uh, you've hit the nail on the head because uh, I see this time and time again where people post these little gifs or whatever of the rock or macho man or rick flair i mean all day long yeah so nobody's it, posting mike schmidt gifs <laughs> no <laughs> well it's, it's positive reinforcement and so yeah. you know i think one of the things that um nostalgia is built on positive reinforcement and so uh you know obviously macho man's been gone for i think five or six years now but his popularity is at an all-time high and, and I think that comes from exactly what you said. So I think it's an uh, excellent viewpoint. I mean, half, half of my responses on Twitter are, I say probably 80% yeah. of my responses are just GIFs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, it's, it's finding that image of something, of someone to respond appropriately to someone's comments like that. I get, oh, this Ric Flair, woo, works perfect right here, you know? Yeah, and it, it just so happens that there's so many good wrestling ones, even if you're responding to something that has absolutely nothing to do with wrestling. Correct. <laughs> so, that, yeah, it's, it's a great point that, you know, we can kind of prop wrestling up more into the mainstream and pop culture, because that's really what, like, you know, wrestling used to be pop culture in the 80s and then during the Attitude Era. And while most, you know, David said, everybody knows Hulk Hogan, but nowadays, like, I don't know, times seem to be changing, but hopefully the GIFs can kind of change things. So I, I haven't tracked this, but it, it does seem like often it's the biggest stars of the sports leagues that end up in a lot of the GIFs and the things that you can choose to drop into Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. So it's going to be your LeBron James is doing funny poses or faces or whatever, and it's going to be The Rock and uh, Stone Cold. And, and you know, those are going to be the most used, but they're also, I think, like there's a lot of them out there. Um, I almost wonder like which leagues are actively feeding those GIFs into those systems mm -hmm. and maybe even like propping them up. It would be smart marketing, I think, because it really makes the brand sticky. And we know, you know, Vince maybe doesn't want to do that entirely right now. Um, Although the times. Vince McMahon GIFs are like my favorite. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> great call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll, so we'll yeah. close it on that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's great. All right, Tony, you're up next. I, I, and I, I want to say I, before you talk that, Somehow, what you're going to say is tied into everything else we've said. I love it. I, 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 I don't have, again, I don't have a, a platform of a lot to talk about. I, I, I want everybody else's perspective on this. I want to know what your thoughts are on, on, I hear people are saving or investing in this hobby. And a lot of them say, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it for the long term. I want to know what the hell does that mean to you? What, what does long haul, long term mean to you? Are you holding on to your cards for five years, 10 years, 25 years? Are you passing them off to someone else in your family after you're gone? Like, I, I, I don't know. I have a very short term in mind because I want to flip what I have to invest in a business that I want to open. So I, I, my perspective is a little different. When someone says long term, what's long term mean to you? Anyway. Oh man, we're talking about value of cards and grading. Oh, there's some people are out there that are going to hate us. <laughs> I don't even, it doesn't even matter to me if it's, if it's graded or if it's raw, I, you're, you're buying something either because you love it and you want to collect it or you're investing in it because you're looking for something, some value out of it long-term or short-term, whatever. What does long-term mean to you? I mean, yes, very people first. Very few people ever, I mean, truly have a coffin card. I think, is it Brett Stacking Slabs mm -hmm. uses that phrase? Yeah. The coffin cards that you would like take to the grave with you and never sell. Like, yeah. is, is that really realistic? I think most people, even if they're long haulers, maybe that's the wrong word to say, but if they're in for the long haul, that they're, um, you know, not going to sell their cards until they're in their 70s or 80s and, you know, 
getting ready to just uh, move on and retire to better times. And anyway, um, you know, what, what does that look like? I, I think for me, I hear long-term from a lot of people and they mean six months, you know, like they mean, oh, I'm holding on to sure. these long terms. I mean, I'm not flipping them in the next three weeks. So a lot of the, the flipping culture, um, they're holding it till the next season maybe is what they mean by long-term to get the maximum return the next year. Um, but the market, you know, market has changed so rapidly and so much in the last 12 to 16 months or so mm-hmm. that you're like, you're right. Long-term could be six months. You know, that's, that's long-term nowadays. You know, it can be. ask me two years ago, long-term be a five-year, 10-year investment. I don't know. Yeah. For me, long-term is probably, you know, the, the true long-term, like the handful of cards that I plan to hold for, a uh, to have a PC collection, maybe my mic in and, um, you know, certain cards that I just love. I'm, I'm hoping to hold those for at least, you know, 25, 30 years. Maybe they go to my kids, maybe they get sold off to pay, you know, to pass money on to my kids down the road. But I, I want to hold those, you know, as I get towards retirement and then make decisions with them. But uh, that's, that's not most of my collection. Um, I, I think I could be liquid with probably 90% of my collection within say five years. And I think that's pretty long compared to most people, but um, that, that would usually be to trade up into something else um, or to winnow down where I have like three of something. I don't need three and I'll keep the best one and then pass the others on. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, I like I, like for David especially. Like this is a great question. I think for David, it's like it's like you have such an impressive collection of so much invested in a particular set. Like, do you plan on holding on to that for the rest of your life? Or do you have a someone offered you a lot of money? Would you take it now? I mean, what what is your plan with that? I don't really have a plan. I mean, the thing is, <laughs> it, well, I mean, it's just not like. Um, I think there's a lot of people that approach the hobby completely differently than I have. Um, You know, I honestly, a lot of it, um, I got real interested in the wrestling all-stars early on, but I also saw it as uh, our chance to make wrestling cards real. And, you know, people can sort of, um, you know, they forget how, poorly wrestling cards were looked at in the hobby and now you know if you look at a a raw set of the 82a you know i've seen a couple sales recently for sixty two hundred dollars on ebay you know that's the second most expensive trading card set from the 80s now uh only behind the um 86 fleer and then i guess in theory you could say the uh star jordan so um i did what you know, I mean, my uh, top set has been uh, it'll, when they, you know, post the this year's winners, it'll, you know, they'll be a, on top for 11 years in a row. So I would say that definitely classifies as long term. Um, you know, there's no intent to sell any of that stuff. I mean, like Gary V, it's funny, I posted uh, a um, my junkyard dog 10 and, you know, he chimes in want or whatever the people say you know the catchy phrase and you know he sends me a direct message a meme yeah (laughs) the art art, they they say like need it is another one um and i just said nah i mean there's zero percent chance i'm breaking up my my sets but but on the flip side um i did you know sort of break my own rules this past year and um i sold some pretty heavy cards um and i just recently uh, sold my 94, uh, Dwayne Johnson, Miami card. Um, I sold earlier this year, the, uh, an 85 tops Hogan 10. Uh, I sold a, um, my only rock 97, 10, because you know, what had happened, you know, the social media phenomenon, um, you know, people get in touch with you. So, you know, both of those, uh, sales came from, social media contacts. Um, And, you know, I think what it really boiled down to was, is that, you know, the the numbers, I mean, they just had gotten so high and it's not to suggest that that that's bad or that they're going to come down per se. It just was, wow, wait a second, you know, um, like this, you know, that's a new car, you know, like, like at some point there's some, you know, real world uh, implications. And, you know, I think the other thing that's, happening you know part of the reason i haven't sold more um this year is because you know what you can't sell 
cards for forty thousand dollars and not pay taxes on them. You know, like when I used to, uh, you know, sell like two thousand dollars a year of cards or whatever, and you know, no big deal. You don't put that on your taxes. It's a hobby. But you know, if you sell a card for forty thousand dollars net to you, IRS wants a piece of that. So I'm there's you know, in my view, like I'm I'm um, you know, just not like let's say a card's a thousand dollars and you know you're in it for five hundred and you sell it, and it's like, is it really worth it? Like, unless you have something else to do with the money, you know, which I, I don't. So I, I, um, I like having this stuff, you know, the goal for me was I, I wanted to have a badass collection and, and the, you know, early on, um, I had decided that, uh, that it was my goal to have the best wrestling all-stars collection. I felt like that was something that, uh, that I could achieve and, um, and I never gave up on that. So it, uh, so, so that said, there's a, an element of my personality that's wrapped up in it. You know, it's one thing to say you collect cards. It's another to say you have, you know, the best sets. And so it's not a, um, it's not, it's not something that I would take lightly just to turn over to somebody else. David, uh, I, I love a lot of what you said there um, and hearing how this past year has gone for you because it's as, as a hobbyist, as someone else in the ecosystem, I mean, I think we owe you a debt of thanks one for just being, having such diamond hands, right. For uh, quite a bit of your collection, because it is tied up into who you are and it, it really, you know, just everybody has so much respect for that. I, I am amazed by your collection, but, um, but to release a few of those pieces is like, it's, it's feeding the hobby, you know, to be, to allow other people to get into some of these big pieces, which there are only a few of, um, that's also good for the hobby, you know, not just a few particular ones to get out to people like that really brings them in and makes them have that important piece too. Well, I totally agree. And it's not because I did it, but part of the, uh, idea was I kind of thought of it almost like being a drug dealer. Uh, <laughs> you need, you need to get, you need to get other people using the drug. Yep. And, and because the thing is, is that the challenge with wrestling cards in particular is there's not they're low population on a lot of the good ones um and they're held in a handful of people's hands and if nobody can get to any of them they give up and there's not like the chase right and so um i sold to steve aoki the uh you know world famous dj he he, he um put the full court press on me and so that was the first deal and um yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's interesting. I just want to go back for a second. He wanted pop culture people. There so you go. Back to, back to your comment about the memes and so on. He doesn't care about uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker or Don Morocco. You know, he wants John Cena, Andre the Giant, you know, uh, Hulk Hogan, The Rock, obviously. So I think that's where the, the thing with the, the wrestling card market is there's a lot of crossover buyers. And, you know, I, I like my Dick Murdoch cards, you know, missing link. Right. But a huge percentage of people have no desire to buy that stuff. And so that's where the stars um, really shine. And I think you're going to see like, you know, a lot of folks, it sounds like your collection is diverse. So adding a small piece of wrestling, you're not going to go buy. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, who's the guy from, uh, um well it is uh Ad not adrian adonis but adrian street, street. <laughs> yeah like that's a that's yeah. a good one Th that's not somebody that you're gonna buy no. but the rock paul kogan randy savage john cena possibly yeah deandre's yep there's yep. he's not focusing <laughs> anyway oh no i'll oh, no, put that back up okay no it's just being there, there you go <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, look at that. I mean, what a great shot of Andre. Actually, Jean Ferre from, I think the picture's from 72. I mean, the card's obviously 73, but. Yeah, totally. Great yep. story on the back, too. That story of him being discovered by the side of the road is super fun. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Rob England helped me get the figure out how to get these cut and assisted me with getting these cut. So that was really great. Looks good. Very nice. Thanks, buddy. I guess I'll give my take on long term yeah uh i think one thing that's really helped me kind of decide on what i'm doing is the activity i am constantly buying and selling 
uh, I, I, I'm basically doing in wrestling what everybody else is doing in the sports card world, but people, you know, they like they're putting those people down. Meanwhile, no one's criticizing me. And it's one of those things where the stuff I'm buying, I'm buying to flip. A lot of the stuff I want to flip is not to go, you know, buy something real life. It's to put it into bigger cards, just coloring up. And the other hard part about this for me is that I'm putting zero dollars of my own money into this. Like I'm trying to fund everything within just the hobby itself from flipping. So buying, selling. And I think one thing that's helped balance that is I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm collecting that truly I probably will like, I don't know when I would sell it because I'm not doing it for the value. Like my Dennis Rodman PC, my Shaq PC, um, my full set of 82, 83 all-stars. Um, I've started the carry and cross PC cause I love that dude. Like when I see him, he's one of the only modern wrestlers where I look at him and I'm like, okay, this guy seems legit. I don't think I want to mess with him. And to me, that's a star. So I start collecting all of his stuff and I'm not grading any of that stuff because I don't care because it's my stuff that I just want to have in binders. It's the nostalgia for when I was a kid. Now let's go to the other stuff. Uh, most of the stuff that I'm buying to flip is actually higher end stuff. So uh, me and Yam talked actually earlier today for an interview on my channel about some of the 2006 Chrome Heritage stuff and the Rock Refractors and the Rock X Fractors. I tried buying a lot of that stuff. I tried buying a lot of the Steve Austin 95 cards and uh, Chromey cards, magazine cards, all the stuff that people are chasing. I was buying in quantities raw. And now, which this will get into my, my topic for the show, I'm waiting all this for this stuff to come back to grading so I can flip it to get into even bigger stuff. You know, maybe a higher grade Hogan 82. Um, some, yeah, I even want some sports stuff. I still want an 86 Fleur Jordan. I still like an 03 Chrome LeBron. Like, I don't care about the grades. It's just, these are the things I want and I know they're liquid. So even if I put my money into them, they're going to be good, whether it's next year I sell them or whether it's like 30 years from now. Um, and then like, my Hogan PMG, it's my favorite card in the whole collection. Most people know that by now. I don't ever plan to sell it, but if somebody came up to me right now and said, hey, I'll give you $100,000 for it, okay. You know, that's that's what some of the basketball PMGs are going for. So if somebody tried to use that logic and said, hey, here's your Hogan at a PSA 9, which, the you know, PMGs do not get, uh, B, actually it's a BGS 9. PMGs don't get that high grade. So to have a card in that higher grade, um, and I think, uh, Drake's PC has got a 9.5. Like me and him, we're like, we bought them almost back to back on eBay. So that's a card that I don't ever plan to sell until years down the road. So that is what long term means to me as far as that goes. But as the million dollar man says, everybody's got a price. <laughs> that being said, the other thing that doesn't get me in trouble with long term hold is the Rock X Fractor, Rock Refractor, Stone Cold Rookies, um, any of that stuff if I get stuck with it, I get stuck with it and I'm having fun. Like, yes, I got it to flip, but I also am just enjoying having these cool stuff. I got video games. I need to get graded. And I, I don't care when it gets back to me. I'm just having fun with it. Um, and, and that's the other thing that really helps as far as like, it ends up being long-term because of a lot of the grading companies. And yes, I would like to sell that to get into other stuff. But if I end up stuck with it for months, years, multiple years, whatever, that's okay. Unlike how many, I'm, I don't know if you guys have noticed as much, you actually probably have so much in the sports card world right now. People are just dumping stuff because they were buying stuff that they, they maybe kind of enjoyed, but they were buying it for all the wrong reasons. Interesting. Absolutely. Really, really well said, Zan. That's um, sums up so many pieces of it. Well, I love it. All right. So next up my topic, and this is, I'm going to throw it at all you guys because I clearly have no idea what to do. This is the first time ever where I usually I'm pretty much taking a stance whether I'm right or wrong and I'm going with it. This one, I truly have no idea what to do. And that's what to do with all these cabinets I have over here of these cards I just talked about that are raw. I don't care if they're gonna grade a one or a 10. I, I need to get specific ones graded. So my question is, and Tony actually mentioned this, what are we doing with all of the other grading companies? I can't, I'm, you can't deny PSA is the Cadillac. It's the top of the line. There's, there's no arguing that, but if they're, if they're going to take forever to get our cards in and I don't actually mind so much getting them back. If it takes a year, it takes a year. I'm okay with that. But for me to not even be able to submit a card at a reasonable price, like Yamwax, you said that earlier. Um, 
I, you know, what do I do? And, you know, I've had really good experience with SGC, but the, the fact is when I got my SGC submission back and I tried selling those cards, I can't even give some of them away. Like I, I ended up making, like, eventually I would cut my prices down and I would make like a 5% profit, which is better than nothing, but people just weren't buying them, even though they were really high grade cards. And then I was looking at HGA and Tony's got, Tony can talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then we see the video came up today and I'm just like, eh, and I hate their queue system, but at the same time, I get it from a business perspective because they, that way they don't over get overwhelmed. Uh, you guys talk about CSG earlier. I've been really looking at them only because their bulk submission is only $8 a card. And at the same time, I know it's a legitimate thing, but the slabs suck. And then we've got these other companies that have really cool slabs and I think have awesome eye appeal, but they don't have the reputation. So what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> all like, hey, let me, let me ask you a question. Can yeah. you give me an idea of like a couple of the cards you're talking about? Um, they're, they're all like lower end stuff. So I have a stack of 2020 Chrome from the rock. So I probably have like, 15 refractors. I've got like probably three green refractors. I have an out of 25. I have an out of 10. So numbered parallel kind of rare stuff that will probably, if I was guessing, probably get like eights to tens because they can't, they're pretty much packed fresh. Some of that stuff, and especially if it's just one card, I know I can just save it for PSA and pay whatever they want to do. But like, I probably have like 30 Steve Austin main event cards that are just sitting there. And I'm like, and the other thing is if I know that if I send a stack of them to PSA, like I don't know if I'm going to get counted off for the grading for being just overwhelmed of the same amount of card. You know what I mean? Well, the, I think this is a really tough question, quite frankly, because um, so I always would back into the cards that I would send in for grading. So for example, $5, uh, it's easy to, you know, win at $8, it's tougher to win at, $12, it's even tougher to win, right? So um, with the turnaround times in the industry tough for the most part of all the companies, I mean, obviously SGC has been moving faster than they were, but I mean, even, um, you know, Beckett can take a year. Um, GMA is a company I've seen uh, some folks, you know, grading with. Um, but you need to do some, risk reward analysis because some of those on the surface my advice would be to not grade them would be just sell them raw because you know the uh incremental value that can be created um like take your sgc experience mm -hmm. you had time you had your own money and you marked them up a little bit uh, but you didn't get that you know like huge kill right, right. So, but if you have any of those rock cards that are lower print um, that you legitimately think have a shot at a 10, you know, that's the type of stuff that I don't think a year from now that the rock's not going to be cool. You know, I think, I think what a lot of people have seen is, you know, the, the prices for a lot of cards have dropped in the past few months, right? Like the, the, the market's pulled off some, but the enthusiasm amongst collectors, I don't think has dropped at all. You know, you, you see one of the things that's been so fun about Twitter is getting to interact with all you guys, but you know, we're a small little segment of, of the collecting hobby. The, the, the big segment is sports cards and, or, or, or the traditional sports cards. And so, you know, you see pictures from the shows in Texas, um, you know, the, the Nationals coming up here very soon. I mean, you're seeing huge excitement online. I mean, my bet is the National is a zoo this year. And so just because prices have dropped doesn't necessarily mean, you know, people's interest is waned. I actually, this was kind of fascinating. The other day, I put, a, I posed a question about the correlation between the crypto market and trading cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody posted a video and it was a car of a card dealer that was getting paid in crypto. And uh, I mean, he outlined to like these great percentages on how much he was getting from, you know, Ethereum or Bitcoin. I think there was a, maybe the other one was Ripple or Litecoin. I can't remember. But anyway, bottom line is once those things started dropping, his, his sales started dropping, right? 
So some of the people didn't have as much firepower. But it's not that they don't want to buy. It's just that, that that maybe they have less, you know, disposable income. So in your case, though, I would I would legitimately um, be cautious about investing too much money in some of these other grading companies um, because I just think that the incremental rate of return that you can achieve and your time value uh, is, is tough. I mean, it's hard to know. And, and if anything, in a couple of days, maybe you'll have a better yeah. picture on PSA as to what their situation looks like. A couple of things before I let you other two, because I definitely want to get everybody's opinion. Uh, David, you mentioned SGC. I'm assuming that would be your second choice. Yeah, I like SGC. I, I, you know, the thing is, I think their grading is accurate. I think one of the things also that SGC has going for them is there are some extremely expensive baseball cards. Uh, in the pre-war segment, a lot of those uh, collectors actually prefer SGC. So, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that made PSA just get so far ahead of everybody was as you get the most expensive cards and then they sell, people see that the most expensive cards are being submitted to you. And it sort of becomes like a feedback loop. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, we're not talking about 52 tops Mickey Mantles here. You know? We're talking about, you know, modern cards. So um, SGC would be my next go-to. But like I said, I think you just need to make sure that, you know, the additional investment, the time, et cetera, uh, is worth it. Yeah. And uh, also to clarify, like some of these things, um, like I, I have a whole 82, 83 all-star set like ready to just send in. So I want to get all of them graded. And I'm thinking you know, like that, that one right there, not even a question going to PSA, but then I have to think of some of these other cards. Like um, I know I could get a guarantee, like a better return on them if they're graded and not raw. But then I, you know, the, the problem is if I want to pay for all of my 82, 83 all-stars to go to PSA, and I don't want to spend my own personal money. I've got to have the funds. So that's where the frustration sets in because I can get that by grading some of the stuff I have and then flipping it. But I, you know, I'm just kind of stuck right now. So, and I think this may help other people too, because I'm sure all of you guys have seen, everybody's looking for at these different grading companies and trying to decide what to do. Uh, if PSA opens up their, you know, value sub again, I mean, that just settles it all right there, but that's just kind of where I'm at to give more, I guess, uh, perspective. Yeah, I think segmenting those cards is going to be really important because you might have different plans for different tranches of cards. So you'll you do have your 82 all stars that you want 82, 83 to get graded with PSA. And what's your timeline on that? Like you probably don't care if they come don't back care. until 2023, which right. realistically could be the case. Let's see that say that PSA opens in the value sub maybe in October, maybe September, or could be January 1st of this coming year. Uh, in that case, you probably aren't going to, you know, you may not see those till 2023. One hack that I'd recommend <laughs> that I'm thinking about those cards I'm saving for that first value opportunity with PSA is I'm going to overnight those the minute that it's available mm -hmm. to send them in, I'm going to overnight them. So mine are the first in line um, as opposed to the people that send mail or other services or send through a group sub, like those might not get in for a few days and that could save you months. That's um, a great idea. Yeah. So just be prepared. I would say like, have those ready to go so that as soon as it opens, you can send them right in, you know, whatever you can stomach overnight is expensive, yeah. but it might be worth it. Um, then yeah, that next batch. So with us, with PSA, I got to say the cards I sent to them, I miss them. Like I, I sent off <laughs> <laughs> like 300 cards and I'm like sitting here and I like when Zan, you and I talked earlier and, and right now there's certain cards like, Oh, I'd love to show that card, but I don't have it. Cause it's at PSA. And as a collector, I, I just kind of miss them. Right. And uh, there's certain cards I just couldn't imagine sending off for a year, year and a half. Um, and, and so some of those, like, I think some of my grading with SGC lately is just the itch of like wanting to get cards and slabs, but not wanting to wait and not, you know, they're not cards that are worth paying hundreds of dollars for. So in a way that is sort of a PC thing. I do hear people talk about like grading with an HGA or CSG or something just for P for PC. If like, you really don't care about the slab though, mm -hmm. you, can, you can buy your own slabs on like Amazon in bulk. They sell 
basically they're not they're not um one touches they're they're like real slabs so if you feel comfortable like snapping those together and stuff you can kind of make your own slab and you can even like make and print your own labels that so could be kind of a fun experiment um i haven't looked into that but I, I know it exists so that's one thing if you'd only want to pay like a few bucks a slab you can do it yourself um it's not perfect you don't get a grade but you have it encased um but yeah i, I like I like SGC the second best myself. I think this, I just think the slabs look great. Here's the thing is like, there's three companies that have a track record that are trusted for grading, that have a brand that have been around and stood the test of time. And it's those, you know, PSA, BGS and SGC. The others we're hoping, we're hoping that they build that track record over time. You can look at what they're doing in the near term, but you know, I, I think some people are almost looking at like an HGA or something as part of their investment plan, like HGA is going to take off as the preeminent grader. And because I got in so cheap um, and they're so fire, I'm going to, you know, my cards are going to accelerate in value. And guys, I think bring it back to the cards, not the slab, you know, getting things graded and trusted, authenticated, that's all really important, but ultimately it's about the card that you have. So don't bank your investment on a grading company that hasn't proved itself yet. You know, that's, that's really taken a chance. Um, not that they couldn't become one of the top graders, but, um, banking on that alone is, I think, um, not your best investment advice. Right. Just my, my gut feeling, that's not what I would do. Um, grade with one of the trusted graders is my feeling. And then keep an eye on those companies and see how they do and consider them as options. But if it's really just for PC, sure. Use whoever you like, but if you just want to get in a slab, like maybe look into that self slabbing option. Tony. Yeah, I, I agree with him. I really do. I think it's just based on what you're doing with your cards. Are you looking to invest and flip? Or are you looking to just pour your PC? You know, I went to HGA and I was lucky to get in with their Q system uh, only because I wanted to try it. I just wanted to try it. And I was missing my cards. I was missing my cards from PSA. Like you said, I've got a full set of 82 Cosmos, you know, that I sent in that I found in storage that I want to, I want to, I want to get graded. So um, I'm missing them. I want to see them. Uh, so I tried it out. I, I like the service, It's you know, attractive, you know, slabs but by no means am i keeping any of this stuff i mean hell you and i are doing a, a trade on these ones for crying out loud so yep. i mean yeah hopefully i'll get those cards soon I, um I, I i just uh to me i just you know, psa is the way to go it's just like you said it's a cadillac of, of of grading i i learned you know from from david over about a year ago it's like that that you, you want something done and you want to get the, the most for your money it's like that this is the company you go with i do like the sgc look i like the tuxedo look i think it looks really slick especially for older cards. Um, and I've got some, like my oldest cards in uh, 1888, you know, uh, <laughs> wrestling card uh, that I think would look pretty cool in a, in a, in a tuxedo slab. It'd be look great. Um, but I'm still new to all this. So it just depends for me. Some of it's going to be for to flip uh, stuff that I really care about, which isn't is very few. Right now I'm a Kurt Angle collector. So I probably just use like an HGA or something like that to, to get my own personal collection of Kurt Angle stuff done. You know, while we're sitting here right now, I'm buying Kurt Angle cards while we're talking this time, right? Um, and uh, that's just kind of where I'm at. I mean, it just all depends on what I want to do with my cards. Now, everything I sent to PSA, everything I sent to PSA is to be sold. I, I have no intention of holding any of that stuff. Even though I miss seeing it, <laughs> I still want to turn around and flip it. I think actually now that you say that, that's kind of more so what I'm doing with cherry picking certain things that need to go to PSA anyway. So for example, I've got a 82 All-Stars Hogan that's not going to grade very well, but I got it from Matt Cardona and it's signed by Hulk Hogan. So like the story of that card and how I got it, like that needs to go in the best possible slab. And I'm also okay with paying a hundred or 200 or whatever it's going to cost to get that, you know, in that specific tier that they have. It's all the, uh, it's all the, you know, cards that are say, um, $200 or less raw that I know I can get a huge value on if I get them in a slab. It's just where to go. And then, you know, trying to keep the snowball going without funding it out of my personal money. So that's just kind of my frustration of where I'm at. But Zan, another thought that I had is I wonder how much the way that you sell cards impacts your ability to sell those alternate slabs. Um, like folks at shows, they can get people enthusiastic just about the individual card. And does it matter if it's a PSA 10 versus an SGC 10 as much in mm -hmm. person? Maybe not. You know, I've heard about people moving those SGC slabs at shows. Here's another thought. And, and honestly, Zan, I think you would find this really interesting. You might want to look into tools like whatnot and loop where you basically do like live streams, but you're selling as well. Um, on those live streams, I've heard cards have been selling for 
quite nice values, sometimes even higher than eBay, um, because people get really excited and you're someone that brings a lot of enthusiasm to a wrestling show. It'd be really cool for one of those channels to have a wrestling sales show that's on weekly or a couple times a month that, cause I know you've got so much and you could work with other collectors to sell those cards. And I think on those platforms, again, people get excited about the cards <laughs> uh, and, and they would sell like some SGCs and some HGAs and some different things like that might have a better chance of selling on a live sales platform. Let me throw an unexpected question back to uh, David and Yamwax. You guys are both huge SGC fans. Uh, like full disclosure, uh, way before we like before any of this crazy stuff ever happened, SGC was my favorite slabs. There's just something about the design that I look. And, and coincidentally, like I think the CSGs are my least favorite, and then PSA is right above that. But I can't deny the PSA value that that label brings. So not arguing that. But do you two see SGC at some point? getting like bridging that like getting closer closing that gap between everybody else and psa i mean to start yeah, or you can go ahead sure you go ahead you I, go first okay i feel like um it's gonna be tough I, I don't see them as i don't see anyone as a contender to psa i mean they've established that premium brand and it happened during a sports card boom where we brought in so many people and so many people are now ensconced in that ideology that PSA is king. It's going to be really tough to topple them. I do think, I mean, like that red top slab is mm -hmm. just, uh, I do think that gives a premium look like, like David said, even though it's simple, like my it doesn't wife, take a lot. My wife calls it, she calls it the, uh, she, she sees other shows. Uh, it looks like a hospital badge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't think that. That's interesting. But the, but the tuxedo looks great. In my opinion, I think it's, it, it's all about like showing off the card and it really, really does that in spades. But, um, to catch up, I, I see it as it's competing with BGS, like who can be number two. And we've seen BG, some BGS, especially the nine, five values really fall off, you know, so can, can SGC, I, I'm measuring them almost against BGS. And I do think that they can come up because I think that, um, you know, when you already have a quality, you, they, they're quality graders, trusted graders, and you bring in such great customer service. And if they keep turning around slabs as fast, it's going to keep luring more people in. Um, and so people getting cards back in two to four weeks is going to get people excited. And, and then suddenly you have a bigger user base and good customer service, good experience, good user base that can lead to more confidence and people wanting then to buy secondary market. So I, I think it can incrementally come up, but not catch BSA. And maybe too, uh, David, before I give you a second, uh, maybe, I guess, maybe start thinking about who I could send to what. You know, some cards might be better off going if they're lower end that I know I can get a better percentage on going to like SGC or something where um, some of the like the all star set or that autograph Hogan or something like that going to PSA and just kind of splitting the difference. Maybe I don't know. Um, I, I like SGC. Uh, I think part of the real issue is, is that uh, I I'm not a BGS fan because I've seen so many overgraded uh, wrestling all-stars and, you know, that was always been my focus. So, you know, it, it's uh, like, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, we saw uh, a nine, five Ric Flair that sold uh, like $8,200. And I mean, that card might grade a PSA seven. Now mm -hmm. there is um, obviously PSA makes mistakes, you know, some stuff's overgraded uh, in their slabs too, but there's a trend with, you know, BGS. And so that's where I kind of went with SGC. I feel like their uh, grades uh, in my view are, are, are closer to PSA. Um, I don't know that I see them bridging the gap. And, and I think the real issue with this is that um, when PSA many, many years ago, so it all goes back to um, the, the mid 2000s when, uh, Believe it or not, you know, PSA and BGS were neck and neck. There was a time where um, BGS and PSA had somewhere around 40 something percent market share apiece. And, and then PSA just pulled ahead by a mile. So by uh, you know, just a handful of years ago, it was deep in the 80 percentile. So when you have a competitor in the marketplace for anything, that has 80 plus percent market share, um, it, it, it shouldn't come as any surprise that they're gonna be the most desired item. And I think some of that has to do with uniformity in collections. Um, I think some of it has to do with the set registry where you know people like me, you know, it's like, 
hey, you have a Brad Rangan's SGC9. Well, okay, but it doesn't help your set. Um, maybe the card's a nine, but if you want it to help your set, you need to somehow get it over into PSA's holder. So, um, but at the end of the day, I think the real question is just going to be, you know, what does the long term for the collectibles market look like? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of folks that make a lot of predictions. Um, nobody saw this huge surge coming. So, you know, it's funny, I, I, I've stopped for the most part, but, you know, I used to be very active on message boards. I've taken my time to Twitter so I can chat with you guys. But um, <laughs> that said, you know, you have people that back when a Jordan 10 was, you know, $50,000 that said there was a bubble. Well, it goes up to 700 something thousand. Now it's in the 200 something thousand. But, you know, I, I'm in the camp that doesn't think it's going back to 50. I don't necessarily think it's going to 700 anytime soon. I think maybe some of the stuff overshot itself. But I really think that the floor for cards has risen. And so a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, if we have even remotely the number of collectors um, participating, you haven't seen anything yet on, on the card market. On the flip side, if the, the, the negative folks, you know, who think this was just a COVID phenomenon, you know, if they're right, well, two years from now, three years from now, a lot of these sort of marginal cards um, aren't going to be very good. Right. And so I, I've never um, I'm not real big on trying to prognosticate because I think the uh, it's just a, it's really tough to, to figure out. So but I do think the odds of SGC, you know, being on par with uh, PSA in the aggregate is not high. But I'll tell you something. If you look at, let's say, a 1952 Tops Mickey Mantle or a T206 Honus Wagner, back what Zan was talking about, I mean, the, a lot of collectors, the, the card itself drives the price. So you have seen uh, some of those cards that are very nice cards and the SGC slab totally compete with PSA. So, you know, if you have a real, real premium card like that, um, where the card speaks for itself, I think that is one thing. But if we're sitting here talking about a Macho Man 86 OPG in an SGC versus PSA, I don't see them competing. I think that's really well explained. Um, you guys got anything else on this topic? I got one more thing to throw at you for some comedy relief. Good. All right. Let's talk about this HGA video. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say a whole lot. I've watched about uh, about a minute and a half, two minutes of it. And that's about it. And I said, I can't watch this anymore. <laughs> is that all we need to say about it? <laughs> now, How now, long is it? I only saw a clip. Is it now, like com compare it to Compare it to um, who did the one recently? Was it SGC? SGC, yeah. That was a very well put together video. I like that video. Uh, yeah. I watched the whole thing from beginning to end, but this HGA one, I couldn't, I was like, did they, they have like their kids produce this? I mean, who, who did this? It was, it was, it was kind of bad. Yeah, it was surprising. I, it seemed like somebody just needed to say no on that one. Like it didn't go through enough approvals or something <laughs> and get reviewed, but yeah, it's, it's unfortunate for them. Um, they're getting a lot of heat on Twitter for it. And you know, they're, they're a growing company and I'm sure a lot of things are in flux. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's one thing I said about HGA the first time, like when they first came out, I was like, it's a new company. And I've said that about Pure Graded X and some of these other companies, like they're new companies, they're going to screw up. And where they go from the screw up is what kind of separates them from a legitimate business as opposed to just a fly by night. You know, uh, Tony, you're out of all of us, you're the only one that's actually got a successful HGA submission. Like, were you happy with your start to finish process with them? Or yeah, I mean, um, customer service wise, I, I can't. I, I have no bad things to say about it. I would usually get a response back within 24 hours, uh, which was good. Um, my 60 day submission was more like 90 days, even with their, you know, their diet they put you on for submitting cards. <laughs> um, so I, I and I got in early because you can tell from your your order numbers. You know, now they're like in the tens of thousands like that. And I was like in like the low 1000s, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, um, it, it took a while, but overall, I mean, I'm pleased with it. It's, it's, 
you know, eye appealing wise, it's, it's nice. It's okay. I mean, uh, I, I don't believe I use them again for anything unless it's something for my own personal collection. Cause I want to have a custom label made or something, but for me going forward, it's just pretty much waiting to see what PSA does. Yep. That's, I think ultimately what I'm going to do. And then, uh, I have seen a lot more, uh, specifically wrestling, I've seen a lot more wrestling cards pop up recently in SGC holders and they're starting to sell. So maybe it's something we can look at. Uh, but guys, this has been fun. Uh, let you guys get your information out there where they can, where people can find you. Yamlocks, we'll start with you. Sure. Hey guys, it was a blast. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm at Yamwax on Instagram, uh, at Yamwax 23 on Twitter and just a collector out there. Love connecting with people. So I hope to there's, connect. There's 22 others of you out there. <laughs> Someone stole Yam Waxen's name, correct? 22 yeah, times. How could they? <laughs> <laughs> well, 23 is just an iconic number. So okay. I, I was like, I, what do I do that Yam Wax is gone? How did that happen? So I, I tossed a number on the end. Yeah. All right, David, most people know you by now, but go ahead in case they don't. God, they can't find David for crying out loud. They don't belong in this. <laughs> oh yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Well, I do overload Twitter with content. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I actually enjoy it because for me, it's it's really just one big advertisement for our hobby. So yep. um, I, uh, I'm on Instagram at 1982 Wrestling All Stars um, and then on Twitter at DPEC100. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, but I, I've, I've had, having the amount of, um, people interacting with our tweets and posts growing constantly uh, has been great because I really think that the, uh, the wrestling card market is in its infancy um, in terms of number of collectors. I mean, you know, I just saw a guy tag me over the weekend, it, you know, made me smile that, you know, he, he, uh, a matter of fact, um, he tagged you wrestling trading cards or site uh that you know he said that he saw one of my tweets and it got him collecting cards again that's the whole point that's right and point. you know the reality of it is is that if people were the reason i create content is one it's fun but two the more people see stuff um the more they might become interested in something you know, and that's why people advertise. So, I, you know, a lot for, of collectors... I'm waiting one day for the David Peck meme. That's what I want to see. <laughs> hey, I'm working on it. Don't give anybody okay. any yes. ideas. <laughs> no, but the thing was, is I learned early on on uh, the message boards that if you talk about stuff and create awareness, you know, like people all of a sudden maybe become more interested. So, you know, by showing our cards and chatting back and forth, you know, it's, it's good for our little niche. Absolutely. Tony, right. what do you, you guys are? I was just gonna say, if you guys are into wrestling cards at all out there listening, follow these three guys. It's just the amazing follows. And and Tony specifically, I, I really hope that you mentioned the Discord for the serious wrestling fans. Yeah, I mean, I was so, I was so surprised when uh, I, I think Zan told me we should start a Discord so like that for wrestling. I go, but there probably already is one. There wasn't one devoted to wrestling at all. Period. You can go to other groups that had you know multiple levels of sports and find like a wrestling channel within that, but there was nothing devoted to just wrestling. So I was like. You know, F it. I'm creating a Discord channel for, for wrestling cards. I don't care. Um, yeah, so everything is all that is all found on wrestlingtradingcards.com, as a matter of fact. So everything is on there now. So the site's been updated, constantly putting checklists up, done about 130 checklists this month alone. Um, the best resource for wrestling it's, cards. It's growing, just man. It's just uh, the image thing is going to be uh, the pain in the ass because I, I lost all the links to the old site, but we still have all the images. It's just a matter of getting to that point where I want to start linking the images. Uh, right now, it's just information. Content is king. So we got to make sure I have it up there and have the checklist up there, information about things, and then, then the images come. So, But everything can be found for, for me personally on WrestlingTradingCards.com. And I'm pretty much at Zan Morning on everything, including MySpace and AOL Instant Messenger still. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Yamwax, David Peck, thank you guys once again for coming on the show today. It's always nice to have these roundtables and just get different perspectives. And David, like you said, just getting the information out there because you never know what thing we may say that might spark somebody to go buy a Don Morocco card. So until <laughs> next time, see you guys. We're out.